Okay, so today we're starting on the topic of forensic serology, um, which means the identification of blood and other body fluids on items of evidence. Um, so you'll notice in the Unit 2 materials, I only give you PowerPoints on blood ID and semen ID. And that's because those are the top two uh, body fluids that, um, as you might guess, that we identify in the crime lab. Um, so realize there are other tests that exist for body fluids such as saliva, urine. Um, there's even a test for fecal matter, which I'm not sure if that's still widely used. Um, usually those body fluids go directly to DNA without doing any type of um, preliminary or confirmatory testing. So that's why um, I'm including just more detailed information um, on blood and semen. But realize when we get to the DNA section that you know pretty much anything that touches or comes out of a human body um, can potentially have cells that have DNA and so you can do DNA typing on those types of samples. Okay, so here's Dexter. I don't know if any, any of you guys watched Dexter, pretty good series. Um, uh, we're gonna talk about him more when we get to blood spatter in our next unit. Okay, so serology is defined as the identification of blood and other body fluids. Now, a couple of terms that I want you to know um, for this unit is, and it's kind of, you know, step one, step two, kind of like you uh, in physical evidence when we talked about doing an identification test versus a uh, comparison test. This is kind of the same thing. So step one is doing a presumptive um, also called preliminary, also called screening test that can indicate what the body fluid could likely be, okay? So it's not, you can't do a presumptive test and say, this is definitely human blood, um, but it can indicate that, yeah, this, this red-brown stain is likely blood, okay? It doesn't tell you the species, um, but it does tell you that it's likely blood. Um, and a lot of times that is enough to then go to DNA. Sometimes, however, a confirmatory test um, to prove exactly what the body fluid is, um, is done, okay? And how that is determined is, you know, what does the detective want done? What does the prosecutor want done? So um, that's how we usually gauge what's, what needs to be done with the case, okay? But um, the important thing, Presumptive preliminary screening, first of all, all mean the same thing, and it's just indicating to you what that potential body fluid could be, and then the confirmatory test proves what that body fluid is. So first, let's start talking about blood, okay? And you know, obviously we all have it, we're all familiar with it. Um, it has some different components in it, which we can see here. You have red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and plasma. Okay, so blood is defined as the fluid, which primarily does gas exchange, okay? So it's carrying oxygen to our cells from our lungs, um, dumps off that oxygen at cells, picks up some carbon dioxide, and brings that back to our lungs so that we can then breathe it out. And of course, you have lots of other things that are being transported um, around the body as well via the blood. Um, but really, you know, when we think of its, its first and most primary function, it's uh, for gas exchange. So we can separate blood into two main fractions. Um, the first are, are called formed elements, okay? And this is also known as the solid portion of blood. Now, some people call it the cellular portion. Um, I tend to go with formed elements because not everything in this fraction is an actual cell, okay? Of course, we have red blood cells, we have white blood cells, and, but then we have these little guys called platelets, which are not intact cells. And when we talk about the, the functionality, and of course, in forensic science, we're talking about, you know, oh, the suspect left, left blood. Let's get the DNA profile from that blood. The DNA that uh, where you can get a profile from comes from your white blood cells. Okay, so red blood cells carry oxygen and they have to be a particular shape to do that. And quite honestly, they don't have room for DNA, okay? And they don't have time for it either, okay? Every, all of your cells that have DNA 
Um, when they replicate, they have to replicate all of that DNA as well, and it takes uh, really about 24 hours. Um, red blood cells, you need to produce a lot of those all the time or else you would be oxygen starved. And so really they don't have room for DNA. Okay, so realize when uh, you, know, you hear on a, a crime show that, oh, we have a DNA profile from blood, that profile is coming from your white blood cells. And white blood cells do have DNA. Um, their primary um, job in your uh, physiology is to help fight infection. And so if you're fighting you know, a bacterial infection, a viral infection, you will see the, the total count of your white blood cells increase um, because that is, that is their function, okay? So they are the ones that have the DNA component. And then you have platelets. So platelets, as I said, don't look like intact cells. Uh, however, they are incredibly important in blood clotting. And they also do not have a DNA component. So those are the formed elements. And then everything else falls into the liquid portion of blood, which is called plasma. Um, and maybe some of you are plasma donors, you know, good for you. You help a lot of people um, while doing that and also earn some cash. Okay, so here's what our red blood cells look like, and they have this characteristic disc shape, and that's so they can efficiently pick up oxygen and then exchange it for carbon dioxide, but no DNA in there. Um, and here's what white blood cells look like, okay? And actually, um, the, you know, in this figure, the, the size is off. Uh, white blood cells are actually much, much larger than red blood cells. And here they're kind of, you know, a little bit bigger, but not really. Um, so yeah, they're much, much bigger. And then you have platelets, okay? And then the fluid that all of that floats around in, that is your plasma. So um, if you, you know, I'm sure you guys have gone through a blood draw, it has to be drawn into a tube. So if you let that blood set uh, on a countertop, you would see that the red blood cells uh, settle to the bottom, and then you have this kind of buffy layer in the middle that is your white blood cells and platelets, and then you have plasma, which is kind of a straw or yellowish colored liquid. <coughs> and plasma, which is a little over half of your blood volume, um, you know, pretty much anything that's not a formed element um, goes into plasma, so everything but the kitchen sink, you know, whether we're talking about vitamins, hormones, your electrolytes, such as, you know, calcium, potassium, uh, chloride, a um, lot of water in there, a lot of soluble blood proteins. This is also where antibodies are, um, you know, certain enzymes travel in the blood, hormones. So yeah, pretty much everything that's not a formed element uh, is in the plasma. Okay, so when we're at the crime scene or back in the lab, what is our basic screening test or preliminary test for blood? And the answer is the Kasselmeier test, okay, which we call KM for short. So the KM test, invented way, way back in the day, still used today, which is pretty amazing. And it is super, super easy and super fast, okay? It, there are two types of chemicals, and the fancy word in science for a chemical that we use is reagent, okay? So there's basically two reagents. You drop them in a certain order onto whatever you wanna test, and um, if blood is indicated, the color is gonna change to a pretty vibrant pink, um, usually instantaneously, and you don't let the test go longer than 30 seconds. Okay, um, the analyst who's doing this will actually rate the result from either negative, which means nothing showed up, to if it's bright pink right away, then that would be a four plus. And so, you know, if it takes a few seconds to turn, then the analyst might call it a, you know, a three or a three plus, um, depending on, on how they grade it. So first of all, let me jump ahead. This is what a negative and a positive test looks like. So the way this is done, I mean, it can be done directly on the material that you're testing, or you can take a sterile um, cotton swab, wet it with sterile water, and then just rub it lightly on whatever you wanna test, and then add the reagents onto the cotton swab instead. And so here we have a negative test. You'll notice there's no color, 
And then there's no mistaking the positive test because it turns a bright, vibrant pink. And normally this happens right away. So the main reason that the KM test works has to do with this molecule that is present in all of your red blood cells called hemoglobin. Okay, and hemoglobin is the protein to which the gases, oxygen, and carbon dioxide attach. And one of the things that's important about hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is actually a clump of four different proteins, but um, all joined together as one. And you'll notice these guys right here, okay? Kind of a red thing with a, a black dot in the middle. Those are what we call heme groups. And then the black dot is a, a, a an atom of iron, okay? So uh, for hemoglobin to function at its most efficient, it has to have these four heme groups and they have to have iron. Okay, if any of you have ever had been anemic or had anemia, um, a lot of times that can be solved by um, giving you an iron supplement um, because your blood cells aren't going to work as efficiently if they are not saturated with iron. Um, I know my grandma used to say, oh, you know, she has tired blood. Um, and what that would mean is, you know, iron poor blood, and it just meant that your hemoglobin wasn't working as efficiently, and that can lead to anemia. So, yeah, usually uh, an iron supplement can help take care of that problem. Okay, so we need all four groups having an iron atom to function properly, and hemoglobin with these heme groups is the molecule that is being identified in the KM test. Okay, now the CAM test can be actually applied to a bunch of different disciplines. Um, so for example, entomology, um, and this is an example of a civil case. Yeah, um, you know, unfortunately, there are some long-term care facilities or nursing homes out there that you know, don't provide the greatest care. This was an actual civil case where um, they had a bed bug infestation, which can happen because bed bugs are nasty and once they get into something, it's hard to get rid of them. But this facility was not taking very proactive measures to rid the mattresses of those bed bugs. And so these poor residents who were not mobile um, and up and moving around were basically being eaten by these bed bugs. And so one of the, the pieces of evidence in this civil case is um, the bed bugs from this particular patient's bed were collected. They were allowed to feed and kind of wander around a Petri dish with some nutrition in it. And after that, uh, after they were allowed to kind of go about their business for a couple of days, um, the, the tissue paper that was in there, and that's what this stuff is right around here. Here's a dead bed bug. Um, was tested with KM and you can see it lights up pink. So what that means is those bed bugs were ingesting blood from the patient. Um, in this case, DNA analysis was done and it was shown that, yeah, that actually was the blood of the patient. And so that patient was just being fed upon by these bed bugs. So whether that uh, became a criminal case, I'm not sure. That certainly is good evidence for a whopping civil case. One other example that I just thought was interesting, this is not gonna be on a quiz or, or an exam, um, but I thought it was pretty interesting, is um, the very, very famous Mexican painter, Frida Kahlo. She's the one with the unibrow. Um, she was thought to have mixed blood in her own blood into her paint and you know to leave a part of her soul in her paintings. And um, so I found this actually, it was a doctoral thesis from an art history major. Um, online and they got permission to take a little scraping from one of her paintings and actually do KM on it and lo and behold it was positive. I'm not sure if they you know continued that with DNA but um, you know they did at least indicate the presence of blood in one of her paintings. Okay so back to the KM test. So the two different reagents or chemicals that are used are this guy right here, which I know you're familiar with, okay? That is hydrogen peroxide. That's what H2O2 is. Um, so, you know, and it doesn't have to be special 
crime lab grade hydrogen peroxide. It can be just the, the, the stuff that you, you know, can buy at Walgreens for 69 cents in the big brown bottle. Um, so that is dropped on to whatever material you want to test. And then what will happen is if hemoglobin and those heme groups are present, the hydrogen peroxide will be broken apart into water and then oxygen gas. Okay, this is, if you've ever put hydrogen peroxide maybe on a cut or a scrape and you see it fizz, um, that is the reaction that is happening. After that, you then add the KM reagent, which has a big long chemical name that I'm not gonna you know, make you memorize. We're just gonna call it um, K the KM reagent. That will react with oxygen and then that is what produces the pink color. Okay, so important takeaway here is you always have to add the hydrogen peroxide first because that's the only way oxygen can be produced and then that is what reacts with the KM reagent. If you add KM first, nothing's gonna happen because there's no oxygen there and then if you add hydrogen peroxide after the fact, you know, it's not gonna work. So it has to be in that order. So KM has a lot of advantages and that's why it's still used today. First of all, obviously very fast, you know, two drops of reagents and then boom, look at your result. It requires very, very little sample. And so if you think of uh, like a typical Q-tip and let's say it's pretty red, you know, it, ha it has some blood on it. If you were to cut that Q-tip up into about 500 pieces, one of those pieces would be enough to be able to get a, um, you know, a clear positive KM result. The other thing that's great is an analyst can do KM testing and then it, it doesn't do anything to the DNA. So you can take that same sample, put it in a tube and extract DNA from it and work ahead for DNA testing. Um, the reagents that are used to perform this test, they're very stable, they're non-toxic. So they last a long time. They can also potentially, you know, be carried in a, you know, a kit in a, a squad car to a crime scene. So, you know, they can, testing can be done at the scene. And both of these reagents are not expensive. And so, you know, they're not gonna cause a huge expense for a, you know, a police department. When I talk about meeting the Fry standard, so the Fry standard is, um, was a Supreme Court decision that basically said if a scientific technique is going to be accepted in a court of law, it needs to be widely used and accepted in the, the general scientific community. So actual scientists with actual degrees um, have to agree that this is a good technique and it has passed that standard. Okay, the other thing that is good is it, it's pretty darn sensitive, all right? Theoretically, it reacts only with heme. Now, there are a couple of um, things that it does cross-react with, and so I'll tell you about those. You know, no test is perfect, unfortunately, um, but KM is really good. And remember, it's only indicative of blood, so it's indicating that there's blood, okay? It's not a confirmatory test. <coughs> Okay, so here's some items of evidence that, you know, potentially, uh, you know, would warrant having a KM test done. Um, so here we have a shirt, and I'm not, if this is removed from a victim, you know, you look at that and you say, my God, that's covered with blood. But um, remember, unless you are specifically trained in that, you don't want to jump to conclusions. So normally when we received items of evidence in the lab, um, it would say, you know, a shirt with red brown stains. And then it was the, the forensic serologist who would, you know, test that um, with KM to show that, yep, it actually is indicative of blood. So here we have a stain on upholstery. Yep, you know, potentially kind of looks like blood, but it could be ketchup, could be barbecue sauce. Here we have some industrial type carpet. Now that could be a coffee stain, could be an oil stain. So yeah, let's either take a little cutting of that and test it or, you know, rub a sterile swab wet with water on it and do some testing. Um, here are some stains that are circled. 
And one of the things I want to note, this is a good example of how a typical crime scene can be, you know, squalor and it can be, there can be, you know, pretty chaotic. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, and probably in a lot of incidents, alcohol is a factor. Okay. No big surprise there, but yeah, those are two big stains that, um, you know, potentially, um, would want to have KM testing done. Okay, so here's some disadvantages of the KM test. There are a few instances where there can be false positives, okay? Uh, no big surprise here because heme groups have iron in them. Um, you know, it could cross react to, let's say you had a hammer and the hammer had some stains on it that, you know, potentially look like blood, but it were actually rust. Um, yeah, those could give you a false positive. But then if you take that sample to DNA, nothing's gonna show up. Okay, so that would show you that, yeah, actually it was probably a false positive. For some reason, and I don't know why this is, um, the CAM reagents will give you a false positive um, if they interact with specifically root type vegetables. So like, you know, carrots and beets, and for some reason, horseradish, you know, but there's not a lot of murderers out there using horseradish, so not a huge problem. Um, another, I don't know if this would be a disadvantage, but yeah, you can't definitively say blood was identified. You can only say that, yeah, this red brown stain indic indicates that blood may be present. Okay. Also remember other species, whether it's dog, cat, squirrel, chicken, um, they also have hemoglobin in their blood. And so, um, whether it's one of those species, um, the KM test would be positive. So it's not species specific, okay? And also remember that KM is a presumptive preliminary or screening test. It is not a confirmatory test. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. We'll pick up in part two, um, talking about luminol. Okay, thank you.